Today, Benjamin is going to be speaking on uh, artificial intelligence and the city. Uh, I think this is an exciting topic for all of you guys. Uh, a lot of the courses, the verticals, uh, my seminars, from a kind of technician's point of view, we've talked about the role of uh, intelligent agency, machine vision, and related, con and related concepts in a very kind of technical or pragmatic way. But I think it's important for all of us to begin to understand the social, cultural, uh, and geopolitical context of these problems as we go into the profession of architecture. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Benjamin Bratton um, for, I guess, lecture number two. OK, thank you, Casey. Um, Thank you for this. So this lecture, which you know, will be two, and I think we'll do at least at least a couple more, will be um, it's a bit more of work in progress. Um, this, the previous lecture on the stack was um, obviously presenting the material of the manuscript as it's already completed and out the door, ready to go. Um, what I want to talk about today is um, probably maybe part one of can you have these. Part one, this part two of the lecture series, and this will be part one of the subsection on AIs and cities, I guess. So some of the, the, the larger questions around what, what do we mean by artificial intelligence? What is that? What is the, uh, 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 what's that for? What, is it, what does it mean? What does it mean for us? Um, and then specifically, I think next week or the week after when we, when we do the, the, the following one, we're going to focus specifically on the, on the um, urban scale. Um, situated in context for this version of an AI or synthetic intelligence, which we'll try to uh, conjure and define into existence uh, today. Um, so I want to begin, however, so we have this nice uh, hardcore uh, technical topic. I want to begin, however, with um, a, uh, a parable. Many of you are familiar, I should think, with the Sanji Pod City near the new Taipei city in Taiwan. This uh, future city was late for its own birth, which was in 1978. Originally planned as a vacation resort for US soldiers, the project was doomed by a series of mysterious car accidents and abandoned in 1980. The future lasted only two years. However, when demolition work began in 2008, it was discovered that not one, but five species of orchid mantis, as yet unknown to science, had overtaken the ruins and multiplied to a population of an estimated 10 million insect inhabitants, above ground, underground, inside the structures, in between them. No one knows how or why. Etymologists observe that the unintended orchid mantis civilization has developed an incredibly complex division of labor, not only within the same species, but between different species as well. These include systems for food capture, nest construction, and stigmergic communication between individuals and groups that had never and have never been observed anywhere else before. The appearance of the mantis has coincided with, as well, with the proliferation of a new subspecies of orchid flowers, which the insects resemble and from which they get their name. Now, orchids don't usually grow in this part of Taiwan, but today they thrive in the unusual labyrinthine cold and darkness provided by the mantis's own architecture. The future city, you see, is not for us. The Anthropocene, the reframing of the Earth in the image of an industrial modernity, will be short-lived, a geopolitical instance more than, uh, more, uh, more than a slow geologic era. Humans are slowly vanishing, even as their aggregate biomass continues to swell. Our cities are not our own. We are building habitats for other forms of life. Humans are the tools wielded by these other forms. We are the robots for future insects. The extraordinary architecture of Sanji, that is the systems built by the orchid mantis on top of and in between the UFO pods, has become in a short 30 years a precious future archaeological resource. It's not a failed future but a successful one. It's our future. We are already its present. 
we who are displaced by the orchid mantis. Double this up, sorry, one sec. So, I want to then talk a bit, shift the discussion a bit from the, the, the question of the stack, as I discussed last week, to the, that of the, what the stack to come, what comes after the stack, or the stack that we might build. Um, and I want to begin with this question of artificial intelligence and synthetic intelligence. Um, with a, a subject matter which I'll talk a bit more about ne the next time, which is matter and materialism um, and this, this, this uh, uh, relationship between form on the one hand and matter on the other, where the object of architecture sits in between. How it is, in other, in other words, that under some circumstances, we take it to, we, we're, we're able to claim, or we're willing to make the claim, that matter has become or has achieved something like intelligence. We take it that the pink goop inside of our heads, a kind of matter, has achieved some level of sapient intelligence. It's a different kind of intelligence than an insect intelligence, but it has more in common with that form of intelligence than, say, the intelligence of how seeds turn, ter turns into trees. But intelligence in one, in, in it, perhaps along a continuum or perhaps along multiple continuums, is an emergent effect of matter itself, of sensing and sensation. I think we're okay. Um, and, and particularly how it is that sense, uh, and, and what I want to talk a bit about is how, both next week and, and next time, is how sensing uh, and the capacity to in input the world and to organize the world to, and to have an uh, embodied relationship with the world, this uh, is in itself should be understood as part of this continuum of intelligence. Now, the, from the Kantian philosophy, there's a, there's a has been and remained in, through to Husserl a fundamental distinction between thinking and sensing. That sensing is something that is a sort of low, uh, a, a low capacity that even non-thinking entities are able to doing, but only these very special kinds of things are able to sense. One of the things that we learn about thinking from research in artificial intelligence is that, the, is that the, the, these distinctions, conventional distinctions between sensing on the one hand and thinking on the other, are, are not so dichotomous, uh, and that we, and that as, as we learn more about, as I'll talk a bit about, about what thinking is from AI. One of the things that we learn is that this is to rethink this distinction. Um, and and as such, that one of the the another uh, point that we'll come back to uh, just a couple times is that. In the observation or deduction that some assemblage of matter is intelligent in whatever way we might observe it to be, that we will be able to say so less because it reflects humanness back at us, that we think that it thinks the way we think we think, but that in understanding how it thinks, we will learn more about what this space and continuum of intelligence and thinking even is and resituate ourselves thereby in this expanded field. That's what I want to talk about um, getting, what I want to talk about today. Um, because I think getting it wrong is, uh, has serious consequences, both practically and epistemologically. Uh, it has imp concrete implications for us. One, mis one of these is a, a, an all too facile distinction between human versus non-human as fundamentally different type types of, of, of positions. Um, and when that facile distinction is made carelessly, uh, as it often is, the, the notion of the non-human, the accessibility of the non-human, is available to us largely by a kind of duplicitous anthropomorphizing of that thing, of giving it a, uh, an, a kind of uh, phenomenology that we un understand in terms of our own, for example. Um, uh, and some of the definitional games of triple O, which I'll speak, uh, I'll speak of next time. Or the concept of corporate personhood, does that matter? Um, and so forth. All right. 
Let me say that I think in terms of the question of not just matter but materialism, Marxism is implied as a kind of historical materialism um, as opposed to a philosophical idealism. But I think that you can tell a lot about someone's materialism, what kind of materialist they are, by how it is that they think and talk about actual matter itself, chemistry. It's importance, it's mutability, it's agency, it's muteness, it's historicity, it's logistics, it's physics, not so much as ontology in ways in which I'll talk about say, It's culinary logic, how it is that the chemical recomposition of matter is inevitably a kind of culinary practice, a cannibal one or otherwise. And so within this, one form of intelligence that matter is capable of is what we commonly think of as computation. Something, as I mentioned last time, I argued that we in discovered more than we invented it, but, and that the measly computing appliances that we've managed to date are but uh, uh, weak simula simulations of the, um, the computation that exists in and as the physical world. Um, we manage these machines based largely on, on the older von Neumann architecture, which turned Turing's virtual machine into a real object. It didn't have to be that way, but it was. They're largely based in silicon, but they don't have to be. Seymour Cray, designer of the these great Cray supercomputers, which are also furniture, by the way. I think more supercomputers should also be furniture. Um, something to consider going forward. Um, had other ideas about using arsenic and other, and other chemicals for this as well. But the most salient universality in this sense is not in the Turing sense of a kind of infinite mathematical machine, as Turing himself had already demonstrated, um, but toward something like a universal machine technology um, and its local instrumentation um, in how it can tr transpose and work between the, these, these transpositions of work and event and movement and ideation into these self-similar and modulable articulations that we call programs. The common denominator of that reduction makes computation generic and plastic and extensible at our own local anthroeconomic, anth anthrometric level. It's able to translate things that we understand as different into things that are, for it, generic and plastic and therefore computable. This is how it sees matter. So the, the hardware, this hardware then becomes the basis in its own way of a self-replicating universality, also of an a algorithmic globalization, which we talked about last week in the context of the stack, which is the condition of the platform that we have today and tomorrow of something else, a next technology, the machine that comes after the computer, um, which, which something else surely probably more biological. And so this parthenogenic replication of the von Neumann machine and its, its intelligence of matter is not the same thing as the replication of the algorithm as itself an instrumental agent. That is, I want to again make this distinction between computation, algorithmic intelligence as something that operates at the material level versus the computational machinery and capacities of the devices and appliances and the geopolitical infrastructures that we um, produce with them. That the capacities and possibilities of the former are, remain and always will remain much vaster, much more vast um, than the latter. Neither are the same as the, recombinant, as the chemical recombinancy of matter itself. Uh, that is a much deeper and richer thing but these computers still, nevertheless, computation in the synthetic sex, nevertheless does provide us, us we, these, we the feeble primates, a little glimpse into the possibilities of design at that same level. Now, as for matter itself, the universe, as you know, is mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, a little bit of oxygen, and miscellaneous other things. This would mean that everything material that has been or could be in the future is a combination of a very limited set of atomic modules, setting aside for a moment the subatomic realm. 
So when we talk about astrobiology, astrochemistry, what exists really far away, it's still, it's still part of a common set. But this still, I think, shouldn't discourage us in the design imaginary. We have existing models of simple nano nanotechnologies doing incredible feats of recomposition with very little energy. Ribosomes, for example, turn food into babies. This, too, is nanotechnology. It's all the same stuff, rearranged. Elemental recombinancy, in this sense, may be closed. It's a closed set in the terms of the table of elements. But it is, is, it, it is also, in this way, locally universal. And for the most part, that universality is still untapped, which is not necessarily a bad thing, always. So the goal is then, is the goal more difference or less? Um, Eric Drexler's famous gray goo scenario, nanotechnology run amok, molecular machines turning everything into a kind of um, a, a, a ge generic beige sludge um, uh, by producing these von Neumann machines at a molecular scale, making more of themselves, exponentially eating all of everything, turning the whole planet into this, into, a, into a, its own ent entropic slurry is allegorical of a certain kind of universal recombinancy, of a self-replicant algorithmic metaprogram run amok using the machinery of a global infrastructure to homogenize all of the things that there may be. This is, on the one hand, the bad news about the, about the chemical recombinancy at a planetary scale. It means that everything, in the sense that, that the, the combinations are uh, universal within a closed set, it also means that the, end, the outcome of this may be, on the one hand, tend toward an ent entropy. But negentropy, the less used term that means the opposite of entropy, uh, is not the only immediate course, is, is not the only immediate course that computational uh, chemistry can take, not difference moving towards the same. Um, the opposite and the blooming of a weird, of new and weird varieties from the same generic sludge, exotic plastics that come from oil, for example, is equally plausible. And so the speculative chemistry at work on matter may itself be the path out of the gray goo scenario of the present, including the global monocultures that we dislike, um, and not its apotheosis, not its outcome. In other words, it works the other way around. So how to map this technological material recombinancy also as not just an under, uh, uh, a theoretical understanding of matter, once again, as a primary condition for design designation and the design imaginary, but also as in, for, in, in connected to this, also as a, as a notion of subjectivity. Of, of agency, of acting against and with the tropes of eros and thanatos, of love, eroticism, and death, is tricky. Freud barely had Darwin, let alone genetics and the rest, in order to understand this, and so probably should be read more like one reads the Greeks. Organic versus inorganic. Remember, for Freud, the death drive was not just a desire to, to die, but a desire to turn back into inorganic material. But for the organic and inorganic is the, diff the distinction that is, do, does it have a carbon atom in it, is a relatively minor issue. Something having that carbon atom is, in a way, beside the point in terms of its designability as matter. A desire to melt back into the inorganic and to be overcome and overwhelmed by that oceanic dissolution to absorbed by the world and by matter itself may be a way of encountering and even desiring death, as, as Freud described it, but it's also a rather everyday occurrence. It's not a sad destiny, I, want, I argue, to be interwoven with alien matter. And the key point is that other diagrams are possible for the world, for bodies, for uh, molecules, for form, anatomic, economic. This human body and this earthly landscape of matter are only the default settings. They are not destiny. Chemistry, 
not necessarily philosophy, chemistry may drive the most radical forms of the political imaginary. A culinary materialism, rubbing the clinamen raw. And so, in this, any instance, singular or plural, of matter, particle or wave, is, as we discussed last week in terms of the address layer, is also potentially identifiable by some massive universal addressing system in which mapping and linking uh, Avogadro's number of, of hiacities or instances of an addressability may be allotted to any and every user such that the global credential of the address is what subdivides heterogeneous territories, hard and soft, Hertzian space, electromagnetic spectrum, with carbon space into a dis disintegrated and reintegratable communicative array, an atmospheric metropolis built of digit strings. That is, we can identify at a chemical level the instances of, of atoms and molecules, but to address them makes it possible to make them, it makes them programmable, it makes it possible to identify them, to send and receive information from them, and to organize them according to algorithmic recipes, hence the culinary materialism. The addressability of physical objects withdrawn into their specific enumeration, not ontologically, but according to this cartographic and communicative matrix, is itself overmatched, as we also discussed, by the addressability of abstract relations between objects. That is, and, and how it is that one thing relates to another, an equally addressable thing, even though it has no, it has no mass. It's also programmable according to the same worldly recombinancy, compositing and sorting both into higher order sets within sets within sets, any of which also addresses and is addressed by one another, each of these things addressing one another, not just us addressing them, in a process, uh, in, in a process of, 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 uh, that is as recursive as it needs to be, meta-addressing all the way up and down into the abyss turtles on turtles. This deep address is not only a mechanism, as I said, for the capture and mapping of what exists and a formalization of the default juxtapositions, it's also a medium for the creative composition of traces, positions, and interrelations between them. And this is the point. Across natural scales, across natural tempos, drawing otherwise illegible forms into a wider internet of addressees. And this places what we now think of as the micron scale processing of Shannon information, that is real mathematical, you know, information as described mathematically, real signal and noise differences, into irregular meshes of networked matter and substantialized abstractions toward an absolute communication, this is its idealization, and also toward an absolute incommunication, illegibility between these two, two uh, addressing matrices, as multiple maps and multiple geographies name and number intersecting territories and enroll their addressees into assemblages that may be effectively invisible to one another. As any addressee that is, is compelled to appear before one platform of ubiquitous computation and programmable matter, this compulsion may also guarantee its disappearance from alternative addressable landscapes to which it may be all but invisible. That is, that any of these total universal addressing schemes may be capable of producing an internally consistent and comprehensive map of the world, and in this sense is a totalizing gesture, but it has no monopoly on totality as such. You can have multiple overlapping, intersecting, interweaving totalities, superimposed, addressing the same thing in different ways that may be congruent and may be totally ignorant of each other. In the end, then, the mastery of master perspectives is overcome by the proliferation of other master perspectives that cannot recognize, let alone contain, one another. And so it's not one regime of programmable matter it's multiple, overlapping, intersecting, equally universal regimes. This 
And at the same time also that those addressees, again, is not that these things become available and communicable to us and for us only, but also one to another. And it's just an exchange of actual information between things without our interference or supervision that is where the really interesting weird stuff uh, is sure to happen. And it's this, the inhumanity of addressability above and below scales of perception that is what refers to the intelligence of matter, but also portends its own microeconomic revolution of sorts, using what was once supercomputing, but is today enough processing power to run a good alarm clock. We see these other projects like CyberSyn that we talked about last week, Salvador, uh, uh, Safford Beer's project with Salvador Allende in, in post-revolutionary Chile to use to, to produce a, a computational map of the Chilean economy and to make it itself uh, at, the, at a macroeconomic level a framework for the programmability of matter getting made, being produced, being distributed, being consumed, not just as something that government does, but what government governance is. How to design an entire economy from the molecules on up. So, one of the things that, um, and also we're gonna, we talked about this in, in, in seminar a little bit, but I wanted to raise the issue again because of the students that were out of town, is that um, it, 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 these kinds of things, it, the way in which some of these other super, the computational platform systems have been uh, understood and critiqued is in relation to what Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian, uh, 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 you know, Austrian school economist called the socialist pricing problems. Socialist pricing problem, to reiterate, is this, that markets send and receive pricing signals. That's what markets do. One of the things that markets do is produce, send, and calculate pricing signals. They, markets are information processing machines. That's how they set price. But it is what Friedrich Hayek called catalaxy. Um, and his argument was that the centrally planned economies can't possibly arrive at a price because they can't possibly capture and understand the information that a, a supply and demand gesture, a purchase or an intention of purchase, in other words, an actual you know, uh, 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 molecular economic event that is happening, send that back to a central processing mechanism and produce and adjudicate a, a price according to that signal fast enough. And when he was writing this, this is basically true. But we now today have lots of examples where platforms are served by much more robust computing uh, and realized thereby a kind of synthetic catalaxy. The price signaling in real time is, for example, no problem for the, planned, the, the plans, the centrally planned uh, economies of Walmart supply chain, Amazon's long tail pricing algorithms, Google's user attention auctions, and so forth. So it's not that as we begin to think about how the, the, the intelligence of matter becomes a programmability of matter, how the programmability of matter becomes the basis of, a, of an economic uh, design mechanism, it's not hypothetical that it would be possible to produce a computational infrastructure that, could, that would, in, in essence, uh, calculate fast enough to, quote, solve the socialist pricing problem. These vet, big capitalist companies do it every day. Um, so not only could some future version of those be used to solve the capitalist pricing problem, as so we also talked about perhaps more interesting is to be used to solve, what we, or solve the socialist pricing problem, they also could be used to solve what we call the capitalist pricing problem. In, in, in classical economics, every transaction has what it's called, has called externalities. Everything that's a form of value, or positive or negative value, that's not, that's not um, added to or subtracted from one of the direct participants in that transaction. I buy you or sell something, but there's costs associated with that, the, 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 the CO2 that's not calculated, the, CO2, the cost of remunerating and cleaning up the CO2 that's not calculated in the price of that gallon of gas, for example. This is what economists call the negative externality. The price signal within capitalist economies is equally distorted in that the price does not include the, the, price does not include the actual costs that um, this molecular material exchange um, actually uh, entails. It's deferred ultimately down the problem, and so that price is is um, is, uh, is distorted. So the capitalist pricing problem, then, just to, to you know to define it, comes from how markets exclude these so-called externalities from the translation and transmission of the price signal. The ultimate public health cost 
of that gallon of gasoline or that coal mine or whatever is not reflected in the price. And so its price is just as distorted as that of an old school planned economy. And you see, again, what happens when the, the let's say, the, the deep materialism of the chemistry that's behind and underneath and is the real cause and effect of any of the, of the economic activity happening at a human level is excluded from the an understanding of, in fact, what's going on, how it is that certain things are made into externalities in the first place, things like ecologies. Um, undistorting, therefore, undistorting the capitalist price, the, the pricing signal within a capitalist economy is the design problem. And so this positive potential variation of algorithmic governance um, might be one in which some and there in multiple various deep universal addressing systems that we discussed. Um, as I said, IPv6 offers something on the order of Avogadro's number of addresses per person. Blockchain is you know, two to the 256 private keys per person, you know, or two private keys. Might allow us somehow in the future to identify and trace particular effects and ramifications of a particular transaction and translation to the extent to which it is possible to know and to model and to map the ins and outs of what happens uh, at a transaction in ways that would be not just similar to the ways in which a Walmart or an Amazon calculates the price, uh, but obviously at an at order of magnitude complexity. It may be possible in different ways, in at least good enough ways, to undistort that pricing signal and to include those externalities in the signal, in that, in that transaction price. So all along the sourcing and supply chain, the disposal chain, the use chain, it adjudicates and enforces that its actual cost is actually reflected in the actual price. There are no true externalities because there is no outside in which to put them. There is no external. Deep incentives to make negative externalities, like for example carbon, more scarce, must be built into the commanding, the commanding infrastructure of the economy itself. Ideally, as I suggest, at the level of information processing, at the level of price. Um, and, as a po and, and, and the building them into the infrastructure itself, I argue, is a, uh, is, I will continue to argue, is the essential design problem. Not the production of temporary autonomous zones in which some other operation might work, but to build it into the, infra the, the master infrastructure itself. To paraphrase Nick Chernesek, Gold, Goldman Sachs is not worried about open source urban gardens or occupying offices of art school administrators. Deep addressability, however, and more pervasive and more accountable supercomputing could contribute to something like a synthetic catalaxy that could realize a shift in structure in the platform itself, not just in its visible cultural effects. Tim O'Reilly um, has, has a nice referee, he argues that um, the killer app of the Internet of Things is insurance. It sounds boring, but I, I think it's actually a more provocative notion than he realizes. If we take it to mean, and we discussed this last week in the thing, thing as well, but I want to bring this up and, and continue the thread. Um, if we take it to mean precisely the long-term risk models of enterprise reinsurance that underwrite for better or worse, um, or refuse to underwrite large-scale capital projects like extracting carbon deposits from under the ground. Algorithmic governance should be able to enforce rules and also to learn. Blockchain advocates advocate and evangelize its decentralized architecture, which is very likely a key means to ensure that accountability on some level. But the transposition of that into a commanding armature means very likely centralization. It means getting over the fact that platforms are both centralizing and decentralizing at the same time. And again, I'm not then arguing pro or anti-platforms as, as either a good thing or an evil thing in and of themselves, nor am I arguing that they're neutral. They're not. And it's their lack of neutrality that makes them useful as a geopolitical design tool. The critique of infrastructure is essential, but it must also rotate into infrastructural scale design models. 
if it is to be serious and not just posturing. And for this, it is useful to think in terms of totalities, as I've argued, because they provide a framework for considering the distributed agency and subjectivity and causality and effect. There are no externalities because, once again, for better or worse, there is no outside. Now, it's been argued, both positively and negatively, that algorithmic governance and neoliberalism economics are intrinsically connected. Um, when I, and I want to argue that, there are no, that no such thing is true. When I teach an introduction to programming, sort of history of programming class to my undergraduate students, I as I think I mentioned in the, either in the seminar here, I, I, I usually begin by teaching them um, um, works by John Cage. Uh, these these uh, uh, instruction, instruction projects, where you have what amount to a recipe or an algorithm that is then deployed and in, in, in developed in different kinds of ways. Algorithms are self-calculating recipes that are dependent partly on the inputs and the outputs and the relationship to these other systems. There's nothing mysterious about them. They are a way in which a particular kind of language structure has technical effects. They are a kind of technology that is constructed out of a linguistic syntax. That's what they are, much like an apple pie recipe. And the disenchantment of these is, I think, an important, uh, is an, is an important starting point to push back against the mystification and demonization of math. Um, because I think in doing so, um, it is not, doing so is not only based on a distaste for certain forms of financialization, which I may share, uh, but also a preference for, or a preference for romantic verse, which I may not. It's also a bulwark, ultimately, and as I will hope to argue, on behalf of what is, at the end of the day, a pre-Copernican and deeply conservative humanist exceptionalism, even a humanist fundamentalism. Of the latter, as I talked a bit about in relation to the user, one of the most difficult shifts in our thinking will need to be around who and what is a user, and who and what is sovereign as a user. And as said, in terms of platforms, states have citizens, markets have homo economicus, and platforms have users. It doesn't work to treat one as if it was the other. The same person or the same thing may be all three at different times, but the governing issues and the organizational issues of the, and the design issues are fundamentally different. The generic universality of platforms makes them formally open to all users human and non-human alike. If the user's actions are interoperable with the protocols of the platform, then, in principle, it can communicate with its systems and its economies. For this, platforms generate, produce, interpolate user identities, whether they're desired or not. Anything that can initiate interactions with the platform can be a user, and the platform may see them and interact with them without knowing or caring who or what they are. Platforms don't care if the state sees you as an illegal immigrant or if the market sees you as an externality. Platforms ultimately don't care if the user is an animal or a vegetable or a mineral. All users in this way share a kind of platform sovereignty. In, in security speak, a user is credentialized by three qualifications. Something you know, like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint, and or something you have, like a key card. So, if someone or something can be, have, and or know, it can be a user. A trading algorithm, a driverless car, a sans-papier arrivé, a refugee, chemical reaction triggering a threshold, a threshold reaction in an environmental sensor embedded in a leaf in a rainforest. All of these are users. The user is an open position. To, and so to develop the political and economic design model of the stack to come is a project that is, there, that is thereby inseparable from a philosophical and technological, practical reconception of the human as a kind of user 
and of the user as something that is not necessarily human. One can expect pushback as fervent as it is irrational. There are some affinities with technology, however fictitious or bizarre, that are thought to embody the essence of a created creationist order. One of these, of course, is food, or of personal mastery over one's domain, such as the car. And I would go so far as to predict that there will be, and this is based on some conversations with some colleagues at Google X who received some weird legal papers to this effect, um, that there will be a movement to identify human-driven automobiles as a type of arms and that the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which is now used to shield gun manufacturers from obvious liabilities and to protect the sense of personal dominion of gun owners, will be flown to keep human beings behind steering wheels. Your life, in other words, may be ended by someone encased in a two-ton steel box careening down the asphalt vista trying to prove a point about how technology will never capture his natural humanity. And so while this stages a, the death of the user, in one sense, the eclipse of a certain resolute humanism, it does so because it also brings with it the multiplication and proliferation of other kinds of non-human or inhuman or exo-human users, including, as said, sensors and, robo and robots and financial algorithms, na from nanometric to landscape scale, and regular old animals, any combination of which one might enter into as one's own in combination as part of some composite user, that one is a component therein. As robotics and cloud, as robotics on the one hand and cloud hardware on the other, of all scales, begin to blend into a common category of machine, it will be unclear in general, in everyday human robotic interaction, whether one is encountering as I said next, last week, a fully autonomous, partially autonomous, or completely humaned, piloted synthetic intelligence. Everyday interactions replay the Turing test over and over. Is there a person behind this machine? And if so, how much? In time, the answer may matter less, and the postulation of human or even carbon-based life as the threshold and measure of intelligence and as the qualifying gauge of a political ethics may seem less like, may, may seem more like uh, a tasteless vestigial racism replaced by less anthropocentric frames of reference, to reiterate this point. Now, a bit then more specifically as promised on AI, what, how that fits within this general discussion of matter, its programmability, its geopolitics, its macroeconomics. The little boy robot in Steven Spielberg's film, horrible film, AI, Artificial Intelligence from 2001, wants to be a real boy with all his little metal heart. Whereas Skynet in the Terminator movies, somewhat better, are, are, is obsessed with the genocide of humans. So despite all of the Copernican traumas that modernity has brought, some forms of humanism and their companion figures of humanity still presume their perch in the center of the cosmic court. I argue that we should abandon the conceit that a true AI arriving at sentience or sapience must care deeply about humanity, us specifically, as we discussed, as the focus of its knowing and desire. Again, perhaps the real nightmare, even worse than the one in which the big machine wants to kill you, is the one in which it sees you as irrelevant, or not even as a discrete thing to know. Worse than being seen as an enemy is not being seen at all, and perhaps that's what we really fear about AI. And in terms of the deduction of whether or not there is a person behind that, um, behind that other user, and what degree of it, and whether or not the, 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 the ascertaining the degree of humanness behind that user becomes a condition by which we would recognize that this matter is or is not intelligent and therefore uh, worthy of the degree of, 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 of sovereignty or dignity. This is the basis of what we call the Turing test, the same Turing of the Turing machine, of course. 
Turing um, proposed his version of the test as a variation on the popular parlor game, um, popular in the 1920s, I assume, in which two hidden contestants, a woman, player A, and a man, player B, try to convince a third person that he or she is a woman by their written responses to leading questions. To win, one of the players must convincingly be who they really are, whereas the other must try to pass as another gender. Turing, as you know, describes his own variation as one where, quote, a computer takes the place of player A, unquote, which in the original imitation game scenario that he described in his 1950 paper, his famous 1950 paper from which it's derived, that is player A is a woman. And so a literal reading of this would suggest that in his version, the computer is not just pretending to be a human, but pretending to be a woman. It, it must pass as a she. And I think it matters quite a lot if only one player is faking or if both are, or if neither are. Now that we give the computer a seat, we may have it pretending to be a woman along with a man pretending to be a woman, both trying to trick the interrogator into figuring out which is a man and which is a woman. Or perhaps we have a computer pretending to be a man pretending to be a woman, along with a man pretending to be a woman, or even a computer pretending to be a woman pretending to be a man pretending to be a woman. And in the real world, of course, we have all of the above. And as we know, rather sadly, Turing himself had also had to pass, um, in his case as a straight man, in a society that criminalized homosexuality. Upon discovery that he was not what he appeared to be, he was forced to undergo horrific medical treatments known as chemical castration. And ultimately, the physical and emotional pain was too great and he committed suicide. So one notes, I think, the sour and ironic correspondence between asking an AI to pass the test in order to qualify as intelligent, to pass as a human intelligent, with Turing's own need to hide his homosexuality and to pass as a straight man. The demands of both bluffs are unnecessary and profoundly unfair. The demands of these bluffs also damage those on the front lines, those who are asked to police them. Blade Runner, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, obviously a much better film, hinges on the, uh, the narrative device of the Voigt-Kampf empathy test, which differentiates humans from replicants. In this world, Turing test thresholds are weaponized, lest replicants pass as humans and trespass beyond their station. By the film's conclusion, Deckard, who himself may or may not be a replicant, develops empathy for the replicant's desire for, quote, more life. And arguably, they too, at least Roy Batty, uh, Rudger Hauer's character, seem to have empathy for Deckard's own dilemma. His dilemma, and ours, is that in order to enforce the gap between the human and the AI, Defined by empathy or lack thereof, Deckard must suppress the empathy that supposedly makes him uniquely human. By forcing him to quash his own identification with the replicants that supposedly cannot have empathy in return, the principle of differentiation upon which the anthropocentric fallacy for AI is precariously perched requires its own violation in order to maintain itself. The harm in this is also in the loss of all that we disallow ourselves to discover and understand when we insist on protecting beliefs that we know to be false. In the 1950 essay, Turing offers several rebuttals to his speculative AI, including a striking comparison with earlier objections to Copernican astronomy. The advent of a robust inhuman AI will surely provide similar disenchantments, Copernican traumas that abolish the false centrality and specialness of human thought and species being as, as uniquely priceless accomplishments. They are priceless accomplishments, but their uniqueness is part of a continuum. Should complex AI arrive, it will not be human-like unless we insist that it pretend to be so because one assumes the idea that intelligence could be both 
real and inhuman at the same time is for some both morally and psychologically intolerable. That appreciation should account for, the alternative appreciation should account for two related but different understandings. One would recognize that intelligence and knowledge is always distributed among multiple positions and multiple forms of life, both similar and dissimilar to one another. It's an imminent condition of matter, not the, not the domain of a particular um, captain's seat on Noah's Ark. This is not to say that nothing is true and everything is permutation, rather that no chemical anatomical disposition has a privileged monopoly on how to think intelligently. Either there is no such thing as general intelligence, rather only situated genres of, sorry, of local, um, uh, uh, no, either this is no such thing as general intelligence, rather only situated genres of limited intelligence, in which case the human is but one of the variety among these, or that there is such a thing as a general intelligence, that intelligence is a general capacity for abstract reflection um, uh, and, and transposition of knowledge from one sense to another, um, but that in this very generality, its accomplishments of generic abstraction are agnostic as to what sort of entity might mediate them. Either way, human sapience is special but not unique. This appreciation would see AI as a regular phenomenon not so unlike other ways that human intelligence is located among other modalities of intelligence, such as non-human, not, such as animal cognition. Sorry, I'm gonna plug my uh, laptop in here real quick, so I realize I'm running out of juice and should have, should have done so before. Speaking of lack of material intelligence. All right, good to go. Now, second, our appreciation of the second thing we might learn from this, from, from this other perspective, is that our appreciation of the wider continuum would also recognize that the potential advent of AGI, artificial general intelligence, is also novel, as yet unexplained, and, and will demand encounters between humans and mechanically situated intelligence that are unprecedented. For this, AI is highly irregular. Both of these are true, its regularity and or its irregularity. And it may, and, and it may be that it's only by understanding one is how we are able to accomplish the other. That is, it may only be by confronting what is genuinely new about non-carbon-based intelligence, possessing such ability and autonomy, that we'll be able to fully recognize the continuum of intelligence with which ours has always been embedded. To put simply, it may be that one indirect outcome of the philosophical discussion about AI is a wider appreciation of non-human animal cognition and its subjectivity. AI may be a boon for animal rights. In some discourses, this conjunction is domesticated under the sign of an all too patch post-humanism. And I consider my work within post-humanism, but I'm critiquing a particular um, set of discourses in, within this. Or a transcendentally anthropocentric transhumanism. Variations of the former, I think, as I say, have much to offer regardless, and versions of the latter should as well, but probably don't in the end. At issue here is more than the limiting contextualization of dominant forms of humanism than it is a relinquishment of what the human and the inhuman is and can be within that expanded continuum. Uh, Reza Nagarastani retains this particular point in his essay, Labor of the Inhuman, by insisting that the easy nomination of certain forms of thoughts and experience that fall outside of various contingent norms, moral or mechanical, as being non-human, is to discard at the outset the integral mutability of the human as a philosophical and engineering program. But the human, in fact, can be remade. 
to be all of those things that we identify as the non-human, at least potentially. That is, the relative uniqueness of human sapience is not what locks down the human as a single fixed thing with essential boundaries. Rather, it's what makes the human as such into an open project of continual refresh, refashioning, unverifiable by essence or by telos. And in considering that capacity in regards to AI, what might qualify as general intelligence is not duty bound once more to species or to phylum, as, as is it, nor in its capacities for abstraction. Ray Brossier suggests that the ability of an organism, any organism, however primitive, to map its own surroundings, particularly in relation to the basic terms of friend, food, or foe, is a primordial abstraction from which we do not graduate so much as learn to develop into something like reason and its local human variations. So in this way, mapping abstractions is not an early stage through which things pass on their way towards more complex forms of intelligence. It's rather a general principle of that complexification. Like protozoa and their ganglia feeling about to figure out what's out there, or like humans tasting and touching and imagining patterns, today's forms of AI are sometimes augmented by various technologies of machine vision that allow them to see and sense the world out there and to abstract the forms of a mechanically embodied intelligence both deliberately programmed for them and emerging unexpectedly. Exactly where to draw a line of distinction between the accomplishments of that AI that, that may exemplify general intelligence that is now operating through their specific new medium on the one hand, or or a specific projection of a locally human intelligence programmed into its, that AI's cognitive prosthesis, on the other, is ultimately unknown and unknowable at present. We can't know that. Again, one might condition the other. In the meantime, we can at least speculate on how we would be able to know where to draw that distinction. Considerations towards this may include how we attempt to program stupidity into an AI, and how we attempt to imbue them with what we take to be our most rarefied forms of ethical reasoning. When one of these dictates the other, it's a moment of high weirdness worth honing in on. How so? In AI research, there's an important distinction made between artificial idiocy and artificial stupidity. Artificial stupidity is achieved by throttling the performance of systems so that it's easier and more naturalistic for humans to interact with them. For example, uh, the way we would, might expect certain variances and textures. At full capacity, the chess program on your phone can beat you every single time, but what, what fun is that? Artificial idiocy is when a system is catastrophically successful at carrying out its exact program up to and past an idiotic extreme. The paperclip maximizer allegory, first described by Nick Bostrom, I think in 2003, is a thought experiment describing an AI that's so successful at carrying out its program to turn available material into paperclips that it ultimately eats the earth and destroys humanity in the process. So many clips, so little paper to clip. Here the AI goes wrong, not because it was throttled or because it malfunctioned or because it hates us, but because it does exactly what we trained it to do, and that turned out to be very bad for us. As usual, science fiction is the canary in the coal mine. Consider HAL 9000 and Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 Space Odyssey, which is really, I think, and made this case to Kier Dulay, the guy who played Dave. He didn't think it was very funny. Um, it's really a drama about HAL's furtive relationship to the alien intelligence. I would argue more than it is about humanity's relationship to the other characters in this triangulation of minds. That is, there's three, there's three dialogues going on here. There's between how, there's between the humans and the alien, Dave. There's between the humans and the AI, Hal. And a third between Hal and the aliens. And I think it's the third where really what the movie ultimately is about. 
After some obscure and unexplained deliberations, Hal, who has been, we assumed, trained according to Asimov's three laws of robotics, and which has the best faculties of ethical reasoning capable, capable of, of, of turning into algorithmic deductions, comes to the conclusion that the human astronauts should be eliminated. Their mission to contact the alien near Jupiter is just too, the mission to contact the alien near Jupiter is just too important to allow for their interference. The AI turns out to be the deepest, deep ecologist. Now, are Hal's actions a form of artificial stupidity or artificial idiocy, or neither of these? Is this a glitch, a breakdown, a final error, or is this the lucid and inevitable conclusion of the moral reasoning that we have programmed into Hal, a reason now trained back at us? In comparison, for example, with the robot, robot ethicists who consider how to train or not train military robots today in the catechism of just war, are Hal's ethical abstractions a violation of that doctrinal program or its, its, its highest achievement? Now, back to the Turing test. Will the wish to define the very existence of AI in relation to its ability to mimic how humans think that humans think, um, will this be looked back on with as, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a dangerous lapse? I think so. It may, the legacy, uh, it, it has also as a legacy sent older forms of AI research down disappointingly fruitless paths. It has, and, and to be clear, the Turing test has no real valence within serious AI research today. But the legacy of older research has sent it down to kind of disappointingly fruitless paths, hoping to recreate human minds from the top down by uh, disembodied symbolic reasoning. It also just doesn't work. As Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig, now the director of research, uh, director of research at Google, uh, remind us in their still quite, quite essential AI textbook, biomorphic imitation is not how we design complex technologies for the most part. Airplanes don't fly like birds fly. And we certainly don't try to trick birds into thinking that airplanes are birds in order to test whether those planes really are flying machines. So why do this for AI? Today, as I say, the vast majority of, of serious AI research has nothing, uh, is not focused on anything like Turing tests other than very specific human robotic interaction contexts like Siri. Um, and yet, in our general discourse about AI, the test's anthropocentrism holds such conceptual importance. Like the animals who talk like teenagers in a Disney movie, other minds are conceivable mostly by way of puerile ventriloquism. As each of us, again, to reiterate this, this, this scenario, each of us will be confronted with, with multiple various and seemingly intelligent surfaces and objects and conditions and composites, some of which are remotely controlled, some of which may be largely autonomous, most of which are a hybrid of the two, both human and non-human at the same time. CAPTCHA programs, those things where you type in the real word, are a kind of inverse Turing test, a computer that is, tries to identify whether you're a human, um, in which the user either passes or fails, yes or no. But for everyday human robotic interaction, the question of locating intelligence will not be such a binary answer. So let's stop asking it that way. It's better, I think, especially for designers, to examine how identification works from our side of the conversation. That is, it's much, much easier to make a robot that a human believes to have emotions, and for which, in turn, a human has emotions, positive or negative, than it is to make a robot that actually has those emotions. The human may feel love or hate or comfort from the AI, but he or she is reading cues, not detecting feelings. What seems like empathy is really a one-way projection, mistaken for recognition, like the Turing test itself, and not based on any real mutual solidarity. Another harm in this epistemic uh, misrecognition is the perpetuation of a relationship to technology that has brought us to the precipice of a sixth great 
extinction. Arguably, the Anthropocene itself is due less to technology run amok than to the humanist legacy that understands the world as having been given for our needs and created in our image. We see this still, and yet it is, we see this still everywhere, and this is why we can't have nice things. A well-known American thought leader in the world of design, who go unnamed, recently wrote, quote, it's time to invent a world where machines are subservient to the needs and wishes of humanity, unquote. <clears throat> if you think so, <clears throat> I invite you to Google pig decapitating machine, and then let's talk about inventing worlds in which machines are wholly subservient to human wishes. Actually, don't. Um, one wonders whether it is only from a society that once gave theological and legislative comfort to chattel slavery that this particular claim could be offered in 2015 with such satisfied naivete. And it's this sentiment, this philosophy of technology exactly, that is the basic alg algorithm of our anthropocenic predicament. It's time to move on. This pretentious folklore is too expensive. In, and in particular, to sort of last point before my conclusion, I want for our discussion, I want to I want to discuss the functional conjunction of of, um, of, uh, of as I said, not just an intelligence, but with the capacity of sensing and sensation. As I as I argued at the beginning, of this thinking and sensing, and it, the way in which it's the um, AI as a form of embodiment in the world cannot be separated from how it actually senses the world and how synthetic sensation is a prerequisite for um, anything that we might define as AI in relationship to that emergent logic of matter. That is, machine vision, machine sensing, and natural sensation. At the level of, a, um, at the level of fundamental physics and biology, um, uh, machine sensing and natural sensation don't operate largely in the same way, but that doesn't mean that we would need to prioritize one over the other, uh, philosophically or politically or practically. And several contemporary technologies suggest that the two in many ways may be converging or may be made to converge. Not just conceptually convergent and categorically convergent as for affect theory or triple O, um, but um, when, and to the point, I think what I'm sort of, by the, di, di, the, why I would want to differentiate the way Triple O talks about a kind of flat ontology and around the non-human and the way I'm talking about this conjunction of, of the, the human and the inhuman in the recomposability of both is that I want to specifically talk about things that are designed and designable at this moment in time. Um, and as I'll talk in the next uh, uh, lecture a little bit about, um, much of what I think Triple O can say about non-human perception and intelligence is true, as is a true or false in 2015 as it was in 2000, 2015 BC. Um, it is, in essence, an ontological claim, not a technical one. And I, the one that I mean to make is one that's actually about the designability of matter at this particular moment in historical and technical time. That is my, this, this, that my as opposed to an ontological claim, which I take to be, in essence, um, uh, pre-Darwinian, uh, this one is not. And so the focus, rather, is on an actual convergence, mechanically and chemically, not ontological uh, cat recategorization. Um, as, for example, um, epidermal microelectronics, for which machine sensing and biological sensation at the level of the skin are literally intertwined. Now, but I want to talk about images today. <clears throat> for, thinking an for thinking animals, Seeing and making things is easy, but making copies of what is seen and made is hard. For machines, on the other hand, making copies is a way of seeing, and much easier than thinking, or perhaps is a way of thinking. As for media technologies that link the two, when information is scarce, then copying something is the work of the mechanical image, the image of mechanical reproduction. However, when information is abundant, and especially when it's overabundant, then seeing the original, picking its pattern out of the background, is now the work of machine vision. And today, many images, arguably most images, are made for no one. But that does not mean that they're functionalists. In purely quantitative terms, um, 
more images are made by and for machines that see the world different, are made for machines that see the world differently than we do, not for human uh, viewers. These machines do not have eyeballs and rods and cones or a visual cortex, but they have sensors that detect light and motion and form and heat and color in other ways. Vision, as you know, evolved many times, more than once. And various photoreceptor cells found across the phyla may have evolved, have evolved from many different kinds of chemoreceptors, and most likely well in advance of any uh, complex brain-like information processing organs. Photosynthesis is, of course, a chemical response to light, and so in the broadest sense, it also could be considered as a kind of vision without images. Now, the animalian vision image-making nexus is obviously primarily human, and it's likely that from the beginning to the end of the Holocene that the total quantity of images that humans have produced from cave walls to FaceTime measured per year or in total pounds of pictures or total terabytes of information, it continues to increase exponentially. And with digital imaging machines now in everyone's pocket, the raw sum of images and the raw quantity of informa imagistic information produced in the last few years is largely more, is, is inevitably more than had been produced since the beginning of our visual history. But it depends, in a way, on how you might quantify an image. What Walter Benjamin called mechanical reproducibility has certainly allowed images to proliferate far beyond the means of human craft. And, as I suggest, in the last decade or two, vision has arguably evolved once more. This time, not for birds or cephalopods or rattlesnakes, but for inorganic species of machines that can make and process images for people to see or for other machines to analyze. And today, the industrial scale processing of data that has been, that has been gleaned by scanning the light spectrum in some way, from urban scale street surveillance to millimeter scale quality control along assembly lines, represents a significant fraction of all of the work that the world does to image itself for the purposes of governing the world and human society within it. At the end of the day, the, the machinic phylum takes many, many more selfies than selves do. But the function of representation is very different, however, within this procedure. The image, quote unquote, remains in many, in many cases, it remains data. It, it is never rendered, re-rendered to look like a, quote, picture because there's no need. The algorithm can be programmed to discern a particular pattern or anomaly. It can see it directly, quote unquote, in the data itself. It does not necessarily need for that data to be reprojected as if for a mammal and then reseen and reinterpreted back into code. Like algorithmic scanning and sorting of any large data set, the fact that the original source was or is, quote, visual is not so critical. And so, like plants, do machines possess also a kind of vision without images? Or at least a kind of image without natural abstraction toward and from corporeal experience that is, or the kind of corporeal experience that we're familiar with, that is, an abstraction that is based in chemical or information pattern finding, but not, but not necessarily as a cartographic simulation of experience, or as a very different kind of cartographic simulation of experience, rather as that experience. Is this its cartography, nevertheless one that is visual in a way, but not in the same way that ours is? Now, on the question of the machine quality of this, and going back to the status of the, of the mechanical image when information is overabundant, some of the it's not only mach mach uh, mechanical images, but images that are machines. Some of the shapes, many of the shapes, more than we know, printed on a dollar bill, for example, are there for humans to differentiate the value of one token from another. And, and I mean, these, these are clear. The ones that are more than we're familiar with are those that are actually there for machine vision to do, perform counterfeit detection and to verify that this is a, quote, real dollar. The piece of paper is full of machines that happen to look like pictures. 
It is image as machine. Or a surveillance scan of a city. It may pick out one face from thousands of these in motion, looking for the one true target. And elsewhere, we insert the fellow Cal IT2 at UC San Diego, known for this his work with uh, Da Vinci's paintings. We insert tiny camera po probes into great paintings so as to verify that they are originals, as is often required by insurance companies backing purchases. Online, as I say, capture software shows you an image and then a, a quick inversion of the Turing test, as I said, um, analyzes how the user interprets it and determines if they are in fact a real person. And so we conclude, from, for our, in news for our historians, that Walter Benjamin's assurances that mechanical reproduction would undermine the aura of the original is true when, for example, we compare a painting with a postcard of a painting. However, machine vision and images as machines, more so, are put to work now instead to ensure, ensure erratic originals, verified non-fakes, true identities, unbroken versions, normal targets, certified real deals, and so a full revolution, in a way, is made back around. As the image is more fully technologized, as it becomes itself a machine, Benjamin's historical arc from pre-mechanical original to mechanical copy is incomplete, really, without another curve, one leading now to a kind of machinic authentic. And so what Ranciere calls the distribution of the sensible must include, if it's to mean anything, machine sensation as well. It must contextualize the sensibility, as it does, of bipedal hominids among inside this larger array and condition, not as the model, but as one of many. And so here among the algorithms, the winding evolution of vision returns to the primordial function of scanning the landscape for friend, food, and foe, and learning how to think in relation to that map. Um, what is or is not like us, what is and what is not sensible or sapient um, becomes part of the story. It becomes the story in its own way, but it's one in which the specificity of our species is defined, um, is defined accordingly, not as the central position from which we depart, but as a particular perch, a redesignable one, a recomposable one, in which we are situated. And so when we speak of the geologic actor of the Anthropocene, it's one that is not in a fixed and essential position, but one that is always sort of in motion. Now, on that, on the geologic and the genetic specificity will be really my last point. At least in the popular imagination, our, I think, still primitive understanding of genomics is beholden to, still in many ways, to pre-scientific, pre, at least pre-Darwinian notions of animal taxonomy and great chains of being. That is, by convention, species equals discrete DNA, extinction equals subtraction of species, and so extinction equals the subtraction of discrete DNA. And in this, we are still arc makers. And yet, um, notwithstanding the epistemological stupidity of that, the project may have some value despite itself. We know that extinction means we really know that it means systems collapse more than the retirement of one character in the show. But counting species remains a good unit measure of that system's collapse, so okay. But likewise, the systemic gathering and archiving of DNA in seed banks and in zoos may enable an eventual reseeding of the planet. Why not? This would not be an inversion of extinction and a restoration of some prelapsarian version of the Holocene, but rather the cultivation of alternative ecosystems from these genetic codes. Again, a culinary materialism put into practice at the scale of, of, of continuing vertebrate evolution. What better? To do so would correspond, I think, in by definition, with a different kind of biophilosophy, and therefore biopolitics, or politics of biology even better. Real biology doesn't conform to clean divisions between organisms and species and landscapes. We can find a single fungus organism that covers 2,384 acres. Under the sea, we observe siphonophores, creatures for which dozens of subcomponent organisms combine into what functions as a single composite body, 
some individuals handling locomotion, others eating and breathing. In your backyard, you can encounter nematophora, such as horsehair worms that take over insects and turn them into zombified prostheses. Everywhere, we are situated within economies of nested parasitism. That is, one species evolved into, in, to inhabit the body of another animal, often in necessary and symbiotic relationships. And so not unlike Russian dolls, a host caterpillar may contain a parasitic wasp larva, which in turn contains another larva, which is home to yet another larva, and so on, so that the caterpillar carries five parasites in total. It's not an it, it's a them. And as for humans, we estimate that more than 10,000 microbial species occupy your internal ecosystem, that inside your body, where you're sitting right now, over 99% of your genes are non-human. You too are a them, an identity which may also challenge the neat coherency of the agency of the extinction of other species, this anthropos of Anthropocene, may turn out to be more of a collaboration that we've undertaken with our uh, actinobacteria, cyanobacteria, and protobacteria that we, we shuttle around. In the long run, as well, they may be the greater beneficiaries of Holocene ecological collapse, more than us. And this would depend, though, on whether or we, we can better serve, whether we or they can better serve as the nested parasites with which a post-anthropocenic species um, to come uh, is able to emerge, the one that we are now constructing. So last point. It is, um, without a doubt, a paradoxical accomplishment to survive a mass extinction event, as we are. The modern human species has the dubious distinction of not only observing and measuring mass extinction while it is happening, but also doing so with the understanding that it is one of the preeminent agents of that event. It does so, however, with the comfort that one way or another, it too is unlikely to survive the bloody edge of the Anthropocene intact. So much departs in what arrives. Simultaneous with a collapse of biodiversity, we also see at least the strong potential for an explosion of new species taking form through robotics and synthetic biology and artificial intelligence. We can't see the latter as replacements for the former, but, and yet there they are. And so perhaps like the small mammals that took over after the Cretaceous Paleocene extinction, these are just better suited to the very, very different punctuated equilibrium to come. They may enjoy successes that we cannot, leaving us behind and stranded in place. Recall that the first earthlings in space were not humans, and that, uh, that a very low percentage of all earthlings in space have been humans. Human biology is needy and fragile, and very poorly suited to space travel, largely because we have to bring an entire ecosystem with us from oxygen to radiation filters to the microbial biome in our intestines that help us digest, digest food. And as currently configured humans, as currently configured humans, we cannot really leave Earth because we have, to, we have to bring a miniature Earth with us when we go. This is not true for the, the same way for other species, which can survive comparatively easily in space, such as metalloid robotics, and, and perhaps also someday some kinds of synthetic biologies, and this guy, the, of course, the tardigrade. So what comes after the Anthropocenic extinction? The only thing we can know about what the post-Anthropocene might be is that it's an era in which humans are no longer the dominant geologic actor. The, the new earthling species may prove to be more fit, better at making the next evolutionary steps than humans are, and so for us to survive, we may have to become more like them and less like what we are now. In the longer view, human's role may be that of an enabling intermediary between early primates and as yet to emerge phyla that blend organic and inorganic flesh and thinking. This is the point of convergence between a robust AI and the deep ecologies of voluntary human extinction. Instead of disappearing, however, we survive by perforating the boundaries between animal and vegetable and mineral. And in this light, we see that pleas to make technologies serve humans and to suit human needs and desires and human requirements 
are misguided and even suicidal. Staring into the abyss of mass extinction, a drearily common refrain, variously explicit or latent, is to identify, quote, modern technology as the main culprit, and to conclude that the most fundamental solution is to de-technologize the planet and to rehumanize ourselves, one presupposing the other in various measure. This is, I put it to you, among the worst possible plans, both philosophically and practically. First, it is tragically deaf to the priceless Copernican trauma of the anthropogenic precedent, precipice, anthropocenic precedent, precipice, that our status as the dominant geologic actor is fleeting and that in order to survive, we will have to become something that is not necessarily and recognizably human. Second, it props up a psychotic misrecognition of what humans, humanity, and humanism actually are. We are the brain-eating apes with weaponized hydrogen atoms who organize our societies according to Bronze Age poetry on human sacrifice and ritual purification. Among the last projects to support is rehumanization in any sense of a re direct return to historical norms. I think the other species would agree. Thank you. So we'll do the question and answer and comment stuff now. about what the design problem is, whereas today you offered um, some more, speci let's say, specific design projects that we need to work on and p p potential solutions. Uh, I guess my question is, it seems like when we begin to talk about the, uh, the Avogadro's numbers of addresses of things and the fact that those things are more likely not going to be populated, populated by humanity, is there going to be uh, how do you how do you circumvent the possibility of it's, I mean it seems like the project that we're talking about as a successful trajectory to maintain ourselves is a transhumanism um, right where we're, we're changing what the human is however it also seems that we're building an ecosystem whether it's you know bacteria eating bacteria and the or plastic eating bacteria ecosystems in the ocean or this like kind of massive unknowable quantity of addresses within the network for that could be populated by non-human users that we're quickly achieving a, a kind of ecology in which we are hierarchically um, less significant than everything else that we've kind of brought into this to the to the world. So how do you begin to that's navigate between part. those two? Yeah, things? that's the good part. Um, well, the second one is that we're designing a, we're designing systems in which the the pre-Copernican presumption of our our centrality within this system. We're building systems in which that centrality is being moved off, we're being moved off center, moving ourselves off center deliberately or otherwise. Is that, that's the second observation? Yeah, so, it just, it seems so that, like the, that, this, this is the good news, I think, right? Right, but it seems yeah. in the last kind of uh, section where you're actually talking about transforming the human species, um, it seems like the project that we're actually generating is the eventual diminishment and eradication as opposed to actually extending the human species into this, this other centralized thing. And is it important? I think they may, in a certain sense, they may, they may be, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit of a predictive question, I suppose. There may be a level of, of way in which these things happen simultaneously, or one presupposes the other in a, to a certain degree. If we, if the human is remade into something that can actually survive the Anthropocene, it would, it may entail to a certain degree a, a certain kind of extinction of a, uh, of a, of a Holocene er version of Homo sapien. I mean, it would very likely, I think more importantly, the argument involved the extinction of a certain conceptual, philosophical, ethical, moral, theological conception of the human. 
more, in other words, it's more about an extinction of humanism as, it, as we've, it, it, in the particular ways in which we've inherited it, um, as it, than it is about um, an eradication of a genome. Some of my best friends are humans. I'm not, it's not about, it's not, I'm not, it's not a call for genocide. No, but I mean, like, no, is the I don't, project I about don't think. I'll have to give it some thought. Maybe, that last, maybe the last, that's what I, uh, it is, actually. I don't know. I was just saying, the, la the last set of points seem to be um, not, or maybe it's the, the project that maybe you're putting forth is that we need to be curatorial about what elements of humanity we bring forward to this transition. Is that the design project that you're kind of setting forth there? Because in comparison to the uh, sure. kind of proliferation of the inhuman, decentralized ecosystems that we're producing, the last kind of couple minutes seemed um, slightly out of place because of the, re the rediscussion of how to bring the human into that condition. No, I don't think so. I think it is the reconstruction of the human to put this back into this condition. I don't think this is, this is out of place. Yeah. Again, I think I'm, I'm trying to underscore the point of a, of a particular understanding of the human as, a, as an actor and as, as, as an agent. I mean, maybe the distinction is this. We're talking about humans both as a design author of these conditions of self, uh, of a certain kind of accidental or deliberate multiplication and ab abdication and, 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 and dissolution on the one hand, and also humans as a species, as a biological condition, as a sapient actor, and as a raw, raw material, that itself may be the object of the design. And so there may, and, and in certain ways these are maybe recursive, but they're not necessarily the same position by which we're, by which we're discussing, right? How it is it that the, does that, does this clar clarify this? I'm not sure I totally understand the distinction that you're making. Uh, I mean, it, even though you, you I, I, yeah, I'm not making this very clear. It is, it just, it seems like uh, within the last sequence, even though it was a discussion of kind of um, the last sequence, you mean the extinction in the yeah. in, in the silver, okay? Uh, and also the the kind of rejection of the the, the anachronistic humanist uh, kind of Williamsburg, but but that's the not, you didn't bring up Williamsburg, but I mean like the kind of return to the the kind of pre-machine human or the kind of preservation of that that humanism. From uh, you were you were kind of rejecting that model, which makes a lot of sense. But um, it does seem that the the project became less about the creation of this ecosystem for the kind of post-human, and and then in the last couple uh, slides, it began to talk more about a kind of transhuman thing, where it's a talking about bringing portions of humanity into that new ecosystem. We have to bring. There's, I'm not. I'm not. We, I, I'm all for bringing portions of of, yeah. of of the genome forward into different nations. The arguments to made is that in order for us to survive the Anthropocene, we will have to become something else. And I, so, it, and I think the, the precondition of that something else is is you can call it transhuman if you want, but you can or or posthuman if you want, but it's something other than what we have. And I think the first pre the, a precondition of that is to understand the mutability of ourselves as a certain kind of sentient and sapient matter within a larger continuum of matter that can be variously sentient or sapient and noble and ignoble in its own ways. And that, and that this level of, of a deeply chemical materialist disenchantment is a precondition for understanding the site condition for that project. And should imply certain methods and outcomes perhaps as well. If that answers the question, yeah. yeah. Okay. So as I said, next time we'll be talking, there'll be the, as after the sort of setup of this particular kind of definition of AI that I've sort of put forward, we'll talk a little bit more about the urban scale in particular, right, and what the implications are of this at this level to be, take the site condition a bit more local. But that's just a neither here nor there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I feel like I should have apologized first of all for my embodied human condition right now. So I'm trying to follow. No, 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 um, no, no. I think I understand that the, that I think part of the argument was that. The human is a user, but the you, but what you're defining as a user is not necessarily human. Is that part correct? Did I get that? Well, humans, a user is a, a user would be a user is a subject. It's a subject position that is constructed by a particular system with th that that position may be uh, operate and interact in relationship to, like a. Uh, 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 a witness in a court of law is a s position that has certain obligations that, you know, a person or a, you know, a, a, a man, woman, or child can step into that particular subject position and and and, and be articulated in a certain way. Humans, the user, humans, the user humans, is cer a subject humans certainly can stand into this position as user and do all the time, and so many. Yeah. Uh, 
but humans can also have other kinds of positions and subject positions that are not user positions that may be good that or are bad not subject, but are also not subject. They, my they, my whole question is about what is I mean, the status of the subject? Is the subject replacing? Is the user, the the category user replacing the subject, or is the category user still dependent of a no. subject? No, the, the I mean very subject. specifically in sort of the technical terms of the model, the user is the user is what we're short is a kind of is a primary. Uh, subject position for platforms, okay. specifically, right? The states, I mean, to, in simplest, in, in the most, you know, sort of rudimentary terms, states have citizens, markets have economic, economic, because platforms have users, yeah? And that one of the implications of the radically open nature of that subject position, and that this, the platform doesn't care whether you are animal, vegetable, mineral, it will treat you as a user all the same, is that we've, we have constructed, I think the bit to Casey's point, we've constructed in, the, in, in our composition of platforms, we have deliberately or accidentally also constructed in a functional subject position that is in a way already much more open as to the material agency and continuum by which things in the world can act and be subjective in relationship to these platforms already. Right? Yeah. That position yeah. is open and we should, we, we, we recognize this as, as a as a, a kind of universal suffrage I think for I subjectivity think. that we would want to, uh, uh, that we would want to be very optimistic about and to, and to work, to think and design in relation to do and on behalf of. I think I, think I follow and I'm curious whether or not, you have, you mentioned this line that, um, you know, worse than being seen as an enemy is not being seen as seen at all, and and to Terms bring up our, like our fear about AI. Yeah, yeah and to why, bring it, why it is that whenever on these stories about AI, it may be very different than us, it may be it's Skynet or things like that, but it's always obsessed with us, right? As it's like its primary thing, it can't get over the fact that the, it wants to be us or wants to kill us or wants it's 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 our yeah. way of dealing with this, this this getting set aside is to think that this that we're still in a way. The protagonist. Yeah, nevertheless, this, the way this plays out politically, and you mentioned Ron Sear, is like this idea of the distribution of the sensible is that some people make utterances that don't count as political speech, and other people make utterances that do count as political speech. And there's something, you know, there's not even the recognition of you, of you as an enemy, right? And so this ha this plays out between humans and humans as well. It's not just of course, AI, AI of course, and humans. Of course, of course, yeah. So I'm wondering whether or not. I guess my question is. Does the platform, or does the machine, or does this new subject position also want? Does it also have a have a desire for a logic of recognition in the Hegelian sense of recognition? Does it still want to be recognized? In, in the, yeah. the non. I think it, I think it would yeah. make room for it. Um, uh, um, let me say is that it's not that these human is that the kind of human to human issues of that Ronciere and others would sort of focus or somehow or we want to suppress them or to make them un reasonable or sort of off the out of the model, but rather that what's at stake is a re-understanding and re-situation and contextualization of them as a as is not the totality of the story, but rather a smaller part of the story within this larger continuum. And once we understand the space of this larger continuum, what's unique and special in particular about these is cast in relief. Its figure ground relationship is more clear to us and what is and isn't specifically human or non-human or ethical or what the terms of, of recognition in fact actually are. We may believe that there's a recognition happening when there isn't for reasons that go to sort of somewhere else. But the question of empathy and recognition across these divides is sort of the, is, is, I, remains, I think, a, 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 as part of the, let's say, a, um, an ethical question, um, uh, uh, probably a persistent one, but it may it, it itself, in a way, contextualized by a larger Continuum and in philosophy, I mean, I prefer to think of this more in terms of the way in which um, cognitive philosophy talks about the, the quote other mind problem. That is, how do you think about how to communicate with a mind that may be sufficiently intelligent for communication, but it thinks and is in the world in a way that's so different than the way you think and are in the world that the common terms of reference are. On so uncertain, and so even the possibility of this back and forth is about. And so, you know, Tarkovsky's Solaris, I mentioned this last week, but Tarkovsky's Solaris and how does the alien communicate to this person? Or in 2001, these are other, you know, communicating with your cat. These are other mind problems, right? Mm -hmm. In this sort of way. 
to me, I find this a much more a much more interesting basis for thinking about how it is that those kinds of empathies may, in fact, um, work out, than, for example, the Levinas tradition of the empathy and hospitality to the stranger and it, the way in which, because it's not, not first of all, because it's not tied to these Judeo-Christian traditions of, um, uh, uh, in which uh, leaves, it's not tied to the specific Judeo-Christian theological conditions, which make a very a difficult kind of limit conditions on what the terms of that debt and obligation should be, but also because it's much more open to um, the kinds of, the variance of possibility of encounter. The Levinas scenario being of reciprocity, it's still a, the reason for this, and Alfonso Lingus in the same way in which his reciprocity works, it's because it's a reciprocity among equals. It's a reciprocity of, of a kind of mutual equality even across incommunication. I don't think we need, it has to be among equals in this way. It can be among things that are actually quite different among things that are not, we are the same, the not these sort of things. In other words, the condition of sameness doesn't have to be the thread that holds this together. The mutuality, that the possibility of debts ever being repaid doesn't have to hold this together in a way, right? We don't, in other words, have to see intelligence, as you can AI, as being something that is, we're willing to project humanness into. It's not alien phenomenology which is a projection of a kind of humanness into these things, right? Whether it thinks it is or not. Um, it, it's, it's rather um, a recognition and perhaps an empathy for something that is, that is, is deeply unlike, yes. But I think, it, it, I, I, hopefully we see this as, an, a, as an, um, an expansion of a subject position, but one in which we, don't, we no longer have a conceptual monopoly over. Well, the interesting thing is that we've designed, we've already designed mechanisms where on a practical level, we don't have the monopoly over that subject position. We're, we have yet to catch up conceptually, philosophically, and politically to the implications of the position we've already made. That is the user position, yeah. right? Philosophy's behind yeah. the reality in this regard. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting here's what we should do hypothetically at a certain sort of point. It's as it's, it's much as saying, this is what we've done. It's, already it's in the process of at work, and the better sense that we we have we have an understanding of that the, that this situation, the the better chance we have of of of, of working with it, uh, yeah, of, of working with it in a way that we would prefer. I think is the point. Yeah. Do you think that the artificial intelligence like projection, um, the fear, like our fear of art artificial intelligence is our projection of like trying to maintain this hierarchy of like the original intelligence versus AI or like our humanity versus yeah. like AI. I think it's a way in which I think a lot of um, fantastic traditions of the monster get brought to bear on the uncanniness and weirdness of the fact that these the stuff around us seems to be alive and thinking and doing things and, and strategizing and plotting against us in ways in which it may not, you know, it may not being, it, it be at all. Um, one of the things I'll talk about in the coming, in the coming lectures is a bit on apophenia and paranoia with this as well. Um, and I don't want to say that this fear, that this sense of, that the anthropomorphizing of AI is reducible to apophenia and paranoia. It's more complex than this. And I, I think I would, we can talk about it again in terms of these, these histories of, 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 of monsters and such. But in the basic sense, it's, it's a way in which that something that's, that's obviously potentially quite powerful, potentially sinister, where the terms of agency and control and outcome are a bit uncanny, um, it's not at all surprising that we would, we would uh, there'd be a certain way in which we assign uh, either a, you know, a, a, great, a, a degree of, 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 um, of um, maliciousness on part of that agency on the one hand, or, and or to see it in terms of something that, that, it, that, that, that maliciousness can be turned into something where it, it wishes, with a hope beyond hope, to resolve that chasm and ultimately to become us again in some way, right? It's a kind of, um, you know, this is the um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein 
that wants to become, you know, that's, that's angry that it's not human, wants to become human again at a certain point, and it's dealing with that existential crisis in this as well. And so I don't know, it's a longer, it's a, there's a longer question. So what extent is that, do we see ourselves in a way as that AI that wants to come back to be the human? I don't know. Or is it just we all really want to be Skynet because we just want to kill everybody? I don't know. You know, these are, these, there's a number, there's a lot of ways to in, enter into this, but I think it's a, it's a, an, interest, an interesting point. And it has a lot to do on a practical level, as I said, with, with um, HRI, human robotic interaction, or the more, somewhat more even interesting field of uh, HAIID, human artificial intelligence interaction design, um, and how it is that we, um, one composes certain kinds of synthetic personalities and intentions in relationship to these systems. Um, and, and so forth. Yeah. Did I talk about the te the AI telemarketer last week? I don't remember if I mentioned this person. No, you would remember. Okay, I'll save that one for next week. Yeah. Or not not next week. I'm not gonna be here next week, but next time. Yeah. Again, just to make sure people aren't. Yeah. Um. So my question goes back a little bit to sort of this. Uh, discussion of the Turing test and yeah. um, artificial uh, intelligence and sexuality. Great. And um, in a sense, there's this kind of, um, in these examples, like let's say like the movie AI, we're sort of this little boy that, you know, little robot boy that wants to be a real, a, a real boy. This kind of sense of um, wanting to kind of trace his kind of genealogy to something that maybe doesn't exist, but he desperately wants it to. And, um, it's, it's Pinocchio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so this kind of sense that we as kind of human makers can't help but transfer our sort of identity crises or sort of kind of uh, this, these discussions of sexual repression or sexual kind of um, sometimes uh, manifestation, we can't help but sort of carry that into the things that we make. Yeah. But then this kind of claim of a technology that perhaps um, doesn't care about us, I think implicates or kind of um, puts forth on the, t uh, on the table a way of making things that's different. So we would fundally, fundamentally have to create these machines or um, set forth on the kind of making of things in a different way. Including ourselves and the remaking of ourselves. Yes, I totally agree. And ourselves would be included in the way in which that that disenchantment of the object, we, we would be included within that, right? I mean, in addition to the more Freudian psychoanalytic projection of anxieties into these prostheses and, and so forth and so on, where, you know, trains and tunnels become about something else and, and so forth, um, that the disenchantment and, and of our own body and our own sexuality through uh, uh, imagining the, the sort of counter empathy that to the extent to which the AI, the AI sees, uh, one of the things I'll talk about in the following things is what I call the uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, inverse uncanny valley. That is that one of the interesting things about machine vision is not just that it sees the world in a different way, but it also, we see, it sees us in a way that's very different than the way we see ourselves. And when we learn to see ourselves, or at least have some empathetic conception of the way it sees us, that disenchantment, that the uncanniness of seeing ourselves as this thing that's kind of human and non-human through the eyes of the machine vision as well, right? We look weird. That not, not it looks weird to me, but I look weird through its eyes. It's the opposite uncanny valley. That this disenchantment, it would imply, also may imply or underwrite or credentialize a much more open and polymorphous and experimental conception of gender and sexuality and how in the vectors of desire and how in, 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 as opposed to the kinds of uh, oedipalized architectures that were that, that, that were continued to continue to wrestle with when body and this is you know this is any kind you know basic um, you know for feminists like Elizabeth Gross have been making this claim about you know thousand sexualities and you know from I mean it's basically it's just queer it's based just queer theory 101 that bodies are a plastic and polymorphous mechanism and that sexuality operates can operate through lots of different channels of course this right and can compose itself and formalize itself and operate itself in this way um, 
and the same is true. And I think to the extent to which, like, to the extent to which the, those kinds of disenchantments of different forms of AI allow for in terms of how we see ourselves, these are some, I think, immediate and at hand ways in which we can, we, it, it not only is how we redesign that stuff, which I think is obviously very important, but also how we rethink, redesign ourselves based upon that, that uh, you know, I, I think this, this, this perspective. Um, since the 60s and until nowadays, like, there, w there was a lot of tensions into like our micro relationships of power in our daily lives that became really clear, like uh, gender issues, racial issues, sexual issues. And the discussion of these issues, like, since the 60s and until nowadays, have brought us like very deep cultural cha changes, not like in a homogeneous um, vision of the population, but in, in some portions, some groups. And as you see in your speech, when you talk about like the, the change of our conceptions as human beings, uh, we say, you use the term we, you, say, you use the, the pronoun we, but in the same way, we can see that the process of the changing of our conception of humans that is already happening in the social speech, it's not happening homogeneously. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this process, like radicalized by technology, could generate some sort of deviation inside humanity as a whole, in in such a process that, like, in the future, we can we can even see like our peers as as different, as some sort of other species. Um, Sorry. There's been a lot of very dark chapters in human history where we've thought of each other as different species. And so I've got to be, we got to be, we have to be careful about that. I mean, that's also part of the legacy, as well, right? The the capacity. There's, and this is this is the risk of this. This is a very risky business. This is a lot of as well. To the extent, there's ways in which a particularly a a, a, a scientifically and philosophically discredited notion of the human has nevertheless been a way in which a mechanism through which we've learned how to treat our, each other with a reasonable amount of due dignity, notions of human rights citizenship, it's why we don't treat each other like logs um, or make lampshades out of each other, except under very dark conditions. You know? And so I think we need to be careful about the way in which, not just to, to, to let, when, when let, when we destabilize this condition of the human, that the, the forms of the non-human, there are already, there are also all kinds of equally, much more discredited and noxious forms of non-humanness or subhumanness that are part of a historical tradition that that which gets pushed out of this notion of the human can easily fall into. Does that make sense? Am I saying this? Because I, I and, see... And, we, and, and I think that we need, this needs to be, this, we always need to be sort of careful of this. The question of what, uh, let me put it this way. I mean, when, when, we under, when, when there's a recognition of the kind of deep, of the essential just material, chemical materiality of our thinking and of our bodies and our stuff, then this is part of a larger and open continuum with and, and the world. There's at least two kinds of ethical projections that are immediately at hand that one would fall back towards. And this goes to the question of the empathy here as well. One is, is that we learn to treat matter with the same degree of love and dignity and empathy that we would treat each other or we learn to treat each other with the same degree of disregard and utilitarianism and contempt that we have learned to treat inert non-human matter. We want to do the former, we want to avoid the latter. Yeah? And so it's not about, um, and so this, I don't know, this sort of deep, uh, you know, this deep atheistic chemical materialism still has to be one in which those, those you know, capacities for um, are all of the um, wonderful things that humans are capable of doing is extended further beyond the boundaries of this particular and discredited species category, I think is the way I would want to put it forward, right? Not to sound too ev evangelical about it. Um, if I answered your the question, but so what you're sort of saying, but I think one of the things that you've suggested is, and this goes with the, the rest of the transhumanism discourse a little bit, though I, I have a lot of problems with transhumanism as it's con traditionally configured. I see it as more, as, as a, not at all about, in too many cases, about going, it is about moving beyond the human diagram or conception, but rather amplifying it to a certain sort of X-Men 
capacity, where it's, it's really it's a reinforcing a notion of the human as the central Vitruvian actor of all things. It's just augmenting it with all kinds of cool shit. We're not really, my, I'm not particularly interested in. Um, but, the, but, I mean, we're already, there's a great deal of di human di diversity within the human genome as it is, as it is now, right? Less, and, and the problem is that we've recognized this in ways that are totally ridiculous, like, de like subdivisions of, of race or, or conceptions around uh, what we take to be gender. Then this, the more we learn about, act the more we learn about genomics and its relationship to biology and neuroscience and the rest of it, the more we realize that those folk categories mean about as much as astrology in terms of the way we, we've done a sort of first pass at pattern recognition within human, human biodiversity. And so it's not that I, we wish to sort of agglomerate everything to all, all forms within the, the human as the, all of the same, not at all, rather that the capacity for heterogeneity and diversity within that, that there's new patterns and, and much more uh, uh, realistic patterns that we might deduce and from the deduction of those patterns, there's new, there's perhaps new um, self-directed uh, evol self-directed evolution design projects that may in fact ensue. But they need to ensue from, I think, this, this. Uh, th they should and need to ultimately ensue from this, the notion of a, this, a projection of empathy and responsibility to matter, as opposed to a contempt for matter. Uh, otherwise, it's, um, the, it's disastrous. Otherwise, it's the Anthropocene. Otherwise, that's what, otherwise, what you have is this fundamental distinction between the, 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 that the ex human experience of human experience is the most important thing, whether that's romantic poetry or buying, uh, make, buying shit for yourself or whatever, but that the human experience of human experience is the primordial importance and that inert matter is this contemptuous stuff around us uh, that is a, a externality, that the world itself is a negative externality towards which and into which things can be thrown. Um, that's the problem. That's where the problem of the particular conjunction notion of the human species as it's, as a, as it's configured and misrecognized, and the particular subjective project of humanism as it had been constructed in this way are mutually um, complicit in the predicament that we now have no choice but to design our way out of, if we're to survive at all. Plus, the Dodgers are going to need relief pitching next year. It's not going to work. Nothing. I'm just, it's like end on a non sequitur. I don't know. <laughs> that just all seemed too, too profound as an ending point. I didn't want to like, gave me the creeps. Uh, over here, yeah. Oh no, you were just, oh, no, it's too late. You raised your hand, you've, the gesture gestured you. No, okay. Um, should we take a break and then come back for the seminar and we'll pick it up again there? Okay, so just, uh, just you know, give us, obviously put a lot on the table, give it some thought. Um, Come back with something you'd like to, those of you who are in the seminar, I'm speaking to particularly, if anyone wants to join us, you're more than welcome to. Um, come with something specific that you'd like to put on the table. It doesn't necessarily need to be phrased in the form of a question like, like, like Jeopardy. It can be a provocation. It can be something that has to do as, that's you know, specifically related to your studio project. It doesn't matter. But something specific that you wish to, to put on the table. And I'm, I'm going to sort of begin by um, you know, asking people to share some of those things with us, right? And then we'll go from there. So show up ready to go, that's all I'm saying, okay? Um, thanks. Yeah. Thank you.